old school bodybuilding clothing company. If leg day was yesterday, and now you're wondering why toilets are so damn low, you are definitely old school. If you're the only athlete at your gym that knows there's a contest today, and it's to see who trains the hardest, you are old school. OSBBC.com for the hardest training athletes. I'm Dave Palumbo, founder of Species Nutrition. From my earliest bodybuilding days, I believed in only putting the best in my body. And that lives on in the Species Nutrition line of products. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. After working hard at the gym, you need a mattress that works as hard as you do. Spinaline has engineered the perfect mattress for you and your active lifestyle. Don't compromise your recovery with inferior sleep. Order your Spinaline mattress today. Hey guys, we're super excited to be here at the LA Fit Expo. It's our third year in a row. And uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be launching a tasty pastry. It's a low carb Pop Tart. It's got three to four grams of net carbs. And we love this show. This is our best place to be in LA. Television on the rxmuscle.com. Ask Dave, better known. I was, I was hitting the space bar. Oh, okay. Wasn't it hadn't started yet? I'll just fix this in post. We'll just yeah, yeah. We'll start from Sid. All right. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Rx Television on rxmuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as hashtag Ask Dave. Your 30 minute question and answer show. With Dave Plumbo, all your questions, diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, news, competitions, whatever's on your mind, bodybuilding or otherwise, it is all on the tables. We now bring in Dave Plumbo. Dave, um, this past Monday, you did another live episode of Heavy Muscle Radio. It was you, Chris Aceto, Lee Priest, uh, John Romano, uh, and you brought up a very interesting angle in it, and that was sort of the um, biggest shockers or the bodybuilder who's going to bring about the biggest surprise of the year 2021. Uh, on the thumbnail, we had, I believe, Nick Walker, Hadi Chupan, uh, Ruli Winkler, and Hunter Labrada. That's brought about a lot of buzz. You have a lot of buzz heading into this contest season now. You're starting to have some of the main players emerge. Uh, obviously, we've had a lot about the Nick Walker versus Blessing Awadibu, quote-unquote, beef but a lot to look forward to as things start to heat up heading into the contest season. Yeah, it's uh, it's exciting finally. I mean, it, it's, it's I mean, it's, it's going to be May pretty soon, and, and uh, you know we're still haven't seen many bodybuilding shows. There's been a couple of them, no men's open, obviously. And you know, I'm not used to that. I mean, we're, we're so used to the Arnold Classic, you know, being that yeah. first weekend in March and, and really getting everything underway and. There's really been nothing to talk about in, uh, other than speculation. So we've been kind of doing educational type stuff and fun stuff and just talking about the old days, really. I mean, that's uh, giving the younger generation the history of where bodybuilding came from is what I've really been focusing on the last three months. And because, you know, you, you have to know where your roots come from. If you're, if you're obsessed with working out and 
competing and you want to be the best bodybuilder, you have to know where the sport started and how it got to where it is. I don't care what you say. You got to become an expert in anything you want to be an expert in. And that just doesn't mean just physique development. That means where it all started, how it evolved the way it did, because it gives it a, a much better perspective in your mind. Uh, and you know the, the legacy that you're kind of carrying on as the new guys in the sport. And there's a lot of new guys coming up, which is making the sport exciting. Like you said, Blessing and Nick and Hunter. And there's, there's, a, there's a lot of great new talent that's coming out in the IFBB in all the divisions from men's physique, classic, open, 212. And that's important because I think we saw, uh, not, I wouldn't call it stagnation because we saw a lot of really good guys, but most of the guys were older. They were in their 30s and 40s. And I mean, Roden went in the Olympia in his 40s. I mean, it, that's just the way it was. And now we have younger guys coming up that are creating new excitement and they're young and they're, they got a lot of energy and they're fighting with each other and arguing and it's, and that's good. That's good. That, that, that gets the, the juices going of all the fans and makes us want to, uh, you know, bring more people into the sport because sometimes when you only see older guys, you know, it feels unattainable, but now with the young guys coming in, the youth that are coming up are going to use them as their idols and the, the people they look up to. So I think it's all good. I think we're going to have a good bodybuilding season. I think we're going to have some, some really standout stars. And I think the Olympia is going to be off the hook this year. Let's go to the question. But before we do that, a very special happy birthday wish, Amanda Palumbo. Uh, Dave, what do you have planned for Amanda on her special day? <laughs> we, my wife and I uh, agreed that we're not, we don't do anything on birthdays anymore. There's no more special. The kids' birthdays we make a big deal about. We give each other cards, and you know, uh, on, on our birthday, I always make, uh, as you guys know, I've always talked about, it, I always make my own cards because my dad kind of ingrained that in my head. And my aunt, wife actually made me a birthday card this year, which she never does, but uh, she and she did a really good job. I loved it. And that's it. It's kind of like you know, we do work as usual, and uh, we, it, the thing that sucks is you really can't even go out to dinner now. I, well, at least we don't. You know, we try to like you know quarantine as much as possible, but uh, we live vicariously through the kids now, so we don't celebrate birthdays much anymore. <laughs> but I do, I do. You know, I wished her on, on Muscle in the Morning, and uh, obviously, I, I I couldn't do all this without her. I mean, she's my uh, she's my right hand woman who probably does way more than I do on a regular basis. She runs all the businesses. She takes care of our three kids. You know, she's the, you know, she's in control. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm her assistant, basically. <laughs> and you know what? It's, um, you know, we complement each other really well. The things that she's strong in, I'm weak in. The things that I'm, I'm strong in, she's weak in. So it, it kind of works, you know. And that's, that's the way relationships got to be. You know, you got to complement each other's, uh, weaknesses and be able to build each other up so that your your strengths and their strengths kind of coalesce together so that you can have a kind of a team effort. And when you have a family, that obviously the kids are the most important thing at that point. And so, you know, we work very hard, but uh, obviously we want to uh, we want our kids to be able to have the advantages of you know just like everyone else does, of being able to have the best education, the best you know everything, so to speak. And uh, I couldn't have done it without her, you know. And like I said, I. When I think about where we've come from, you know, going from New York down here, it's uh, we've had a lot of different, we've overcome a lot of obstacles, let's put it this way, over the past year. So I love you, Amanda, and happy birthday. Let's go to the questions. The first two questions, of course, from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. The first question, split leg squat or Bulgarian split squats where you have one foot up on a bench uh, in a lunge position holding a dumbbell. Do you like them? You know... Squatting is a um, is a compound movement. It involves a lot of balance, and I um, I always find that some of these variations uh, can be dangerous. Some of them, nothing beats old fashioned, you know, wide stance, feet forward, full range motion, below parallel squats. I mean that that th there's no variation that can fix that now. Our lunges, are these, you know, box squat, uh, all these other ones, do they have, they have merit, but they're, nothing's going to replace the full range motion, you know, squat with the bar in your back. Whenever you start making variations on that, you're, 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 it's like you're almost like trying to target certain muscle groups or maybe, you know, affect weak areas. Like I used to do a Smith machine, I would do, lunge, I would lunge back on the Smith machine, essentially doing a one legged squat. 
Now, you can't go very heavy doing that, but you can make sure it becomes a unilateral movement so that each leg is working independently. And so I, I find I used to like to really make sure that my, my legs were balanced in size, uh, in shape. Same thing with upper body, and that's why I did a lot of unilateral stuff. But you're not going to build the, the, the mass, the sheer mass, doing anything that's a little that's got variations. I and once again, I have a lot of uh, clients I work with on a regular basis, and they're always asking me about workouts. They're like, "What do you think about this work?" And I'm like, "You know what? Give it a shot for six weeks." Because anytime you change up and vary your training, you're shocking your body, and that will institute new growth. So even though it might not be the best exercise in the long run, in the short run, it might be exactly what you need to kind of get past the plateau. So I'm all open as long as you're doing safe things in, in the gym, you're not doing stuff that's risky where you're going to get injured. I'm all for trying new different variations on things. But at the end of the day, if you want big legs with good development, okay, nothing beats the regular squat. Second question again from the Dave Plumbo Experience app. When you use your rotational diet uh, for three days, protein, carbs, and fat, and one or two days, protein and fat, what's the goal? How are you going to lose body fat? I My, my variation really is more of a protein. It's a lower fat. Protein, um, vegetables, and a carb you know, day rotated with a protein and fat day. And then obviously, if, if the person needs ultimately to go ketogenic where they're just doing protein and fat days uh, with, with one day a week where they're having a cheat meal, then that could be instituted as well. But when I first start out, I like to give people more food because they don't necessarily need to go that low off right off the bat. The way you lose weight, okay, is really by, at least in my, in my estimation, is by adjusting carbohydrate intake. So if I'm doing a protein and fat day and carbs are basically non-existent, you're going to lose a lot of weight on those days because you're very low carb. On the days they do give, give carbs, okay, I'm not giving a lot of carbs. So maybe the person's getting 150 to 200 grams of carbs on that day, but that would be a big person. That would be a you know 250, 260 pound person usually, you know unless the person's got a ridiculous metabolism. Protein obviously is based on body weight, so you know if you're a 300 pound, 280 pound bodybuilder, you're going to get 350 grams of protein a day. If you're 180 pounds, you're probably going to get way less than that. You're going to get you know 250 grams of protein a day. So that's based on body weight, and then fat is based on body weight too. So if you figure out what the person needs, metabolically speaking, and of course, we're always estimating as coaches because you can't really predict unless you've worked with the person before, you put together a diet plan that you think is going to be you know, below what they really need so they can start you know, digging into stored body fat. And if it works, great. If it doesn't and they're not losing enough weight, you got to remove, you got to lower your, their food intake. You know, usually, I play with carbs first before I start lowering fat and protein. If that doesn't work and they're losing weight too quickly, you might have to increase carbohydrate intake or increase protein because they may just have a really gifted metabolism. And that's where, you know, people can say, you know, templates, template, everyone get, uh, Dave, this guy, everyone gives out the same diet. Well, you know what? If you go to a coach that has a lot of athletes and has been doing this a long time, everyone knows the diet that they give out because everyone has a, a standard, you know, that they kind of, I guess you could say, formula that they work from. But it's how you adjust the, the variables of the diet. In other words, how, do, how much protein am I going to give a person? Am I going to remove protein? Am I going to add carbs? Am I going to take away carbs? Am I going to add cardio? How you play with those, the macronutrient variables okay, as the diet progresses is what makes a good coach. Because it, that's, it's not a static type of program. You don't just give someone, here's a diet, take this in 16 weeks, talk to me, you'll be in shape. No, it doesn't work like that. Things change. The body changes. You have to make the, 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 these variations. That's why I have guys sending me, you know, and girls sending me updates two to three times a week because I got to make the variable changes if necessary. If, if everything's working great, right, you don't make any changes, and that's just what coaching is all about. And that's what I teach in my Secrets to Becoming a Diet Guru course. Which, by the way, a lot of people have been asking me when I'm going to do it. Um, I was waiting to find out when I was going to get my radioactive iodine, which is going to probably be May second. So I'll probably do the, the Guru course at the end of the uh, at the end of May just for people who are asking. Let's go to our Instagram questions. Again, if you're not already following us, our handle is official underscore RX muscle. We actually, um, Tyler, our producer, launched a new handle yesterday. So many of you, sometimes in jest, sometimes I guess maybe you get annoyed or whatever, but uh, you always, often note that Dave is doodling during an episode. And sometimes you'll be like, all right, at least show us what you made. Well, this handle, it's Dave Palumbo's doodles. <laughs> doodling right now. 
Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Dave Palumbo Doodles. Uh, we linked it on our main Instagram yesterday. So if you want to give it a follow, you'll see all of Dave's, whatever he's making in studio. So have some fun with that. But again, if you... If you're watching us for the first time on YouTube, hit the subscribe button below. Hit the notification bell. Not going to miss any of our shows. Tyler didn't even put the good stuff. That one was yesterday. That was my Aztec warrior. But (laughs) (laughs) but you didn't even put the good. You got to dig through my pile of stuff Uh, over there. You know, I plan to. Uh, Lots of new content. (laughs) He put all the crappy stuff up. I got good stuff too that I think is good at least. So again, it's Dave Palumbo Doodles, and if you're not already following us on YouTube. (laughs) Hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, hit the like button if you like what you're watching. Comment if I get more subscribers to that, Sid, than I, everything else I do, I'm going to be very depressed, actually. But uh, maybe I'll have to change professions. There you go. Dave Alum with the artist. But as always, we thank you all for your ongoing support. Uh, let's go to Manzo Low. Dave, my LDL cholesterol is 313 after my recent blood work. My question is, even if my particles are large, is this something to worry about? If so, do you have any recommendations on how to lower it? My HDL is 53. My triglycerides are low as well. It's pretty high. Um, I wouldn't be too thrilled. What I always tell people to do is before you panic when you get back a really high LDL, I I always tell people, you know what? Go for a uh, cardiac CT scan where they're actually going to visualize your your coronary artery vessels. If you have no blockages or any kind of calcium deposits, then don't worry about it. You know, then it's not so severe. If, however, you go and you have blockages, now we have a double problem. We have the problem of the blockages that they're going to have to possibly have to stent. And then on top of that, we got to get this cholesterol down because obviously that means the cholesterol is causing a problem. That, that's very high. I would immediately put people on uh, an, a good quality essential fatty acid a product that's balanced in omega-3s and 6s coming from fish oil and either evening either evening primrose oil and barrage oil, something like, I don't know, do I have omegalize it? Like omegalize would work. I would put them on a, on a high quality fiber supplement because we know fiber binds up um, LDL cholesterol and pulls it out of the body. So that will lower your LDLs right there, something like my fiberlized product. Those are the first two things I always do for people with high cholesterol. Also taking good mono and saturated fats in really helps as well. Extra virgin olive oil, macadamia nut oil, avocado oil, okay? but. The main thing I would do is if, if I was nervous about, hey, am I going to have, do I have blockages or something like that? Or is this something I got to worry about? I'm going to have a heart attack. Go get checked. That's an easy test. So you have a baseline now to follow and then you can get it, you know, followed up every, you know, couple of years. You can get another scan and, and you can see, you know, exactly what's going on with the coronary arteries. Because most people who have cholesterol levels that spike at 300 or something like that, that's got to be genetic. Because, you know what? You don't get those levels if you're working out hard and your body fat is not super high. If you're running those levels as a bodybuilder, it probably runs in your family. And I'm sure more than one person in your family has high cholesterol. So before you have to go on statins and all kinds of extreme measures, check your vessels out, number one. Number two, essential fatty acids, fiber supplement, monounsaturated fat. Those usually will lower it. Give it like three months, get retested, and and I bet you'll come back with some good numbers. Let's go to Joseph Lanker. Uh, if someone has a relatively short torso and long femur bones, are free bar squats going to be more risky in terms of injury to reward leg size? Short torso, long leg bones, is that what it was? Well, yeah, long femur bones, yeah. That's me. I mean, I have a very short torso, very long legs for my, um, for my height. And uh, I found that was a really good squatter, so I don't know. You know um, what are they concerned about? I, I guess the risk versus reward for that. I never got any injuries from squatting, believe it or not. I, I found it worked really. When you have a short torso, I think sometimes it's, it's better. You, you have good core strength usually, you know, as long as you train your abs. If you have problems at your back or something like that, that's a different story. Now, a lot of people have biomechanical issues because they have, their feet are not good. And that's why I tell people get uh, custom orthotics. Okay, you can get them made by a chiropractor or a podiatrist. They, they mold your feet, they, they correct your arch deficit, because we all have an arch deficit to some degree, and when you put a lot of weight on your back, you know, it kind of compresses the arch. So if you get a rigid orthotic, which is, that's the device they put in there, and you slip it in your shoe, and you wear it all the time, it's usually made of plastic or something like that, fiberglass, it holds your foot into the right configuration, which aligns your spine and your hips and your knees and all that great stuff. So you're not going to really get hurt as much. I had chronic... 
uh, lower back throwing out when I first started squatting. And I had, I didn't realize it, but I was, I was wearing orthotics from running because I, I had used to get chronic groin strains when I would run. And then I was prescribed orthotics, one of the first people to actually get them, you know, the real ones that they actually custom made them, put them in my shoes as a runner back in college and it solved my, all my injury problems. And then when I started bodybuilding, I, I stopped wearing them because I didn't, I didn't even think that I even needed them anymore because I wasn't running anymore, right? Well, sure enough, I started throwing my back out for no reason every so often and I couldn't figure it out. I said, I wonder if it's, I wonder if it's these orthotics I need, you know, because I, I realized I had no arch and I, and I just put two into, it was like a bell went off in my head. I started wearing the orthotics, never had another problem. My leg development completely changed. It got really good. Uh, I was able to push from my heels. So that's a, that, I always tell people, there are, you know, just like you go out and buy a belt when you first start training, everyone should have a, a pair of custom orthotics. And they don't last forever. They only last about two, two to three years, the max. And you wear them all the time. So you're going to have to have them replaced on a regular basis. Just make add that into your regimen of things that you do for bodybuilding purposes. And the heavier you are, the more benefit you're going to get out of them. I promise you. Let's go to B Winery 20. Have you ever had a competitor eat a high sodium meal a few hours before going on stage? Also, some coaches have their competitors eat pickles. Have you ever done or seen other competitors doing this? <laughs> you know, I, I've heard a lot of people with the pickle stuff. You know, Reese, a lot of people are like, can I have pickles? Can I, eat a, can I eat like five pickles a day? I'm like, no, you can't have any pickles. Sorry. If you want salt, salt your food, okay? There's no extra food in the diet, okay? But yeah, I, 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 I only, you know, a lot of times my routine is to keep salt high the entire diet. Usually the day before the show I cut sodium. I have, lately I haven't even been cutting it. I just find that people go flat. You know, when you're training regularly and you're sweating a lot, you, you don't really retain you know, sodium. And when you eat a lot of sodium on a regular basis, believe it or not, your body, your aldosterone levels are very low in your body and your body just flushes sodium out real easily. When you start restricting salt, that's when your body goes into that conservation mode and it raises the hormone aldosterone, which is responsible for sodium reabsorption. And then you're fighting aldosterone and you don't want to do that. So I always give the people salt. I might, like I said, if a person's a little watery the day before the show, I might cut sodium early in the day. But usually before they go to bed, the last meal, I'll put sodium back in. And then the day of the show, because they're not drinking, I have them eat sodium to keep their electrolytes balanced and they're not, not cramping. You can't retain water if you're not drinking anything. So you can eat as much salt as you want the day of the show. You know, you're probably just taking tiny sips and stuff like that. Maybe you're having a drink after prejudging or something like that. But by and far, you know, you definitely want to have sodium the day of the show. Once again, so you don't cramp, especially if you're on prescription diuretics. Let's go to Bobby, uh, Booby Bobby Trap Lord. If you're bulking and gaining weight slower, but staying tighter than usual, should you add more food or let the weight gain stay slower? My metabolism has gotten a bit out of control. And I don't want to eat more just to gain more fat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there's no reason. I, I always prefer to watch guys grow on a very slow, steady basis. And my competitors out there who might be who I work with who might be watching this know it. You know, they'll they'll gain a pound or two every you know seven to ten days, and it's slow, but it is consistent. And and they don't get fatter; they just get better. And that, I think, is ideal. Rather than seeing, I have some guys, they can gain five, six pounds in one week. I'm like, I don't know how you, how the heck did you do that? Because I always had a fast metabolism. You know, I couldn't do that. But five, five six pounds, I, and it's not good weight a lot of times. It's a lot of bloat. Some of it's body fat. You know, obviously some is muscle. But I would rather see people gain slow and steady. Because it's, it's not a marathon. Okay, if you're doing a six-month off-season where you're trying to put on mass... You know, that's, you know, six months times, you know, whatever, four weeks per month. That's, that's like 25 weeks, you know. If you, you know. if you gain two pounds a week, you know, one to two pounds a week, that's a lot of weight. That's a lot of muscle you can put on. So, to me, that's a better way to do it. Obviously, the first, you know, when you first start eating a lot of food, you might put on, you know, eight to ten pounds the first week just from, you know, glycogen loading and, and fluid, a little fluid retention. But once you get into a, once that all is loaded up, Slow and steady is the way to go. And like I said, I, I wouldn't, especially if you're, e if you're an easy person who gets fat very, you know, at the, 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 by looking at food, you definitely don't want to overdo it. Now, if you have a super fast metabolism and you just, you'll, I have guys, I, I'm feeding so much food, I can't believe it. And, and then not even, 
not gaining. They're actually losing weight sometimes. I'm, I don't know how it happens. And then I have to find ways to sneak you know, nutrients into them via shakes, via blending their food, whatever the case may be. We got to get that food down. So it's, it's a much better case that if you can eat less and gain slowly than if you have to gorge on food and barely be able to put muscle on. Let's go to Hunter Coyle. Does injectable testosterone show up at any point uh, in a urine test? No, they have to test for you know anabolic steroids or, or, or testosterone. So if you're just going for like a routine drug screening, like for marijuana, cocaine, you know, amphetamines, that kind of thing for a job, it's not going to come up. Now, if they're if they're if you're on probation because you got arrested for selling steroids and, and they're testing you specifically for that, then that's a separate test. And yes, a urine test can detect metabolites of anabolic steroids and it can also detect testosterone ratios that are too high. Because remember, for every molecule of testosterone you produce naturally in your body, you produce a, a certain you know amount of epi testosterone. Now, when you inject testosterone into your body. The testosterone level is high, but the epi testosterone doesn't go up because you're not you're not making it in your body. Okay, it's it's an exogenous source. So when you, they test your ratios in your urine of the ep testosterone to epi testosterone, testosterone will be way higher than epi testosterone. So there's a, a much bigger gap, and that's how they can tell that something something is not natural there. And then a lot of times, if they really want to verify it, like with sports. They could do what's called an isotope, a carbon isotope test where they could actually determine if you actually have synthetic testosterone in you. It's very expensive to do these. So on a routine drug screening, no one's doing this. But if they want to get you or if there's a the reason for them to believe that you're on anabolics and that's something they are going to test for specifically, they can do it. But routine drug tests usually don't do that. Let's go to Philip or Philippe Rowe. Most common way for a pro-natural bodybuilder to water deplete before a contest. You know what, it, it, it's hard for me to give blanket statements like to, to this. You know, what's the best way to deplete? Well, go cut your carbs out, you know. Keep your protein higher. Keep your fat moderate. And let those glycogen stores deplete out. When we talk about depletion, we're talking about getting the carbs that are stored as glycogen in your muscles and in your liver and depleting that, right? So that means training low on basically very, very low to no carb, you know, intake and let your body eat up the carbs that are in, in the glycogen stores. You can deplete your glycogen stores in two to three days. So let's say you did like a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday depletion, and then you filled up you know, half of Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday you know, with, with glycogen again, and, and you re-glycogenate the muscles. That's what we talk about when we deplete and then carb load. The advantage of depleting before you carb loading also is a lot of times you can store more glycogen inside the muscle than you normally could because when you're in a depleted state, the, uh, the enzyme glycogen synthase that stores glucose as glycogen inside the muscle elevates itself way higher than it normally would appear inside the muscle because it doesn't see any carbs. It goes into a panic and it overproduces itself. Now when you put carbs back into your body, there's more glycogen synthase available to store glucose as glycogen. So a lot of times you'll overstore glycogen, which makes the muscles a little fuller, a little bigger. In some cases, it doesn't look better. So you got to experiment and see how you look. Uh, some people don't even need to deplete. They're depleting the whole diet. They're on a low-carb diet, and they just add it back in the last couple days, and they fill themselves up. So it really depends on your situation. Time for a couple of more questions. Go to Neil Zalewski. My question is, why does it seem that muscle separation and lines have become to be a thing of the past? People have the conditioning, but everything blurs together. You know, it's, it's impossible for me to give an answer to that question. I see guys today that look crazy shredded and separated. I see other guys that look like maybe they're shooting their body parts too much and maybe it's blurring some of the definition. Because a lot of times it doesn't, but if you don't put it in deep enough, there's, there's a science. You know, there's good artists and there's bad artists. And some people just don't want to diet hard enough to get that lean look. I, look, I've worked with people and they're petrified of losing muscle. And... Very few people who are on anabolics who, and who are eating enough protein are ever going to lose muscle, even when they're on zero carbs and they're and they're doing a ton of cardio. The problem is that they think they're they people think that they have more muscle than they really do when they start dieting. Hey, I was 280. I must have you know 280 pounds of muscle. No, you're not. You're 280 and you have 260 pounds of uh, and you and you're really 260 because you're holding 20 pounds of water. So after two weeks, you're down to 260 and 
Now you have to get rid of the 30 pounds of fat on your body. Now you're down to 230, and now you get it to deplete water, and you're down to 220, you know, 218, 219, you know, and, and you're in the uh, heavyweight class, and you thought you were going to be a super heavyweight, and you think you lost a ton of muscle, but you didn't. You really, you just got in shape. So some people are afraid to do that. Hey, I don't want to go. I don't want to be heavy. I'm a super heavy. So they, they instead of going down to 218, which they should have, they stay at 230. So they're 12 pounds overweight. They look pretty good, but they don't have glutes and hams that are really detailed. They're a little too full. You know, they look almost like they may be in guest, a little better than guest posing shape. And so maybe they have a good, you know, you know, you know, hands together most muscular shot. They get a good front double bicep, but then the rest of them there's just not as much detail showing. And so people think, well. Uh, why, why it's the drugs they're taking that they don't have no it's just probably that they didn't diet long enough and hard enough and didn't lose enough body fat and that i that happened back in the 90s and 80s too there were guys that would you know would never be lean enough and you'd be like man if this guy ever got in shape he'd win everything it's the same thing today last one uh asian anonymous 06 j versus 20 rami who wins that's a that's a very good comparison. Um, I, I I think 06 J wins. Um, I just think J had a little bit more conditioning than Rami had. While Rami may have some better tools than J, I think J was so polished and so sliced. You know, he would have outconditioned Rami. And 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 the size difference is not that much. They're probably about the same size. J is super wide. You know, and and so Rami doesn't overwhelm him in any pose. I don't think. You know, and so I, I give it to Jay probably, but but it, that would be a good show. Now, if Rami can come in tighter and get that level of conditioning that Jay had, then you're talking about you know maybe Rami beating Jay. But I, I think Jay would match up really well with a, with a Rami. I mean, Jay beat Ronnie. Let's face it, and and Ronnie was had more wow than than Rami. I mean, yeah, he when he beat him, he was his lat was a little small that one year, but he was still pretty good. And, and Jay beat him. So I, I don't think that, um, and this, was, this wasn't even the 06 Jay that beat Ran, uh, Ronnie. So I think 06 uh, Jay beats Rami, but I think it's a very close competition. And once again, if Rami comes back better this year with better, grainier, drier conditioning, now we're talking about I, I would have a trouble you know, deciding who wins that, that competition. But I haven't seen Rami look like that yet, so it's hard for me to even make a you know, guess on that one. That's going to do for this episode. We have to wrap because we do have a, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a guest that we've had on before, but it's been a very long time since we've had him on the channel. We wanted him to get him on the channel, but he's had obligations to another channel, but uh, it looks like we're going to have him on again and it's going to be great to catch up with him. So uh, stay tuned for that episode, that new interview, new episode of live with coming up on the rx muscle youtube channel again if you haven't already done so hit the subscribe button below hit the notification bell for tyler shore and dave palumbo i'm sadiq faruqi we'll see you next time